Sam, thank you very much for coming on to the Security Space podcast today. What we will be discussing is DFIR and why it's all bunched into one and why these two concepts and that are two separate entities are, are paired together. Um, but yes, before we get into it, are you OK just to give uh, the audience a little bit of an introduction to yourself? Perfect. Thank you, Nick. Um, yeah, of course. So I'm Simon Lang. I'm the head of digital forensics, incident response and e-discovery at uh, CyberClan. I've been in the um, cybersecurity industry now probably about 15 years. Uh, prior to that, um, I was in the Royal Military Police um, in the British Army, which I did roughly six, seven years in um, prior to going to university studying computer forensics, which then allowed me to get my first job in actual digital forensics. Um, in my current role, it's mainly orientated towards the incident response space and supporting clients and customers um, when they've been breached or compromised. OK, perfect. So let's get into it then. So I reached out to you to, to do this pod um, because I've seen that um, DFIR, they just get bunch together. So I think a good place to start is what is DF? What is digital forensics? Could you describe what it is to me? Yeah, of course. So digital forensics. So this is um it's quite an easy question, but it's also a hard question as well because they do intertwine quite often. But if we start off with digital forensics. So at the beginning of my career, um it was all digital forensics as um I covered. And um, mainly I say mainly um, often digital forensics is to support law enforcement um, or to support the defence um, on the opposing side of that because everyone is entitled to a, um, a fair trial. But digital forensics is often what we call dead box forensics, whereby we have a computer, um, we take a hard drive out in the olden days. Um, now we often have to um, collect the data live from it, but we just capture the data from that computer and we have a really low level look at what data is on there to try and prove or disprove a crime has been committed on it. Um, so for instance, um, someone's been downloading images they're not meant to, pictures from the internet that they shouldn't have on their computer. So a digital forensics expert um, will have that computer. The computer would have been seized by the police. Um, the hard drive will be imaged. So a bit for bit copy of that um, drive uh, will be taken. And then the analyst, the examiner, will look at the data on that and try and attribute um, when pictures have been downloaded, when videos have been downloaded, um, try and show a little bit of pattern of life of that, Has who is at the keyboard at the time of um, those offences uh, taking place. It could also be for fraud as well. So people have been cooking the books, um, for instance, in, in accounting. Um, it, any crime nowadays um, has a digital element to it. Um, so, yeah, often people are called in to um, carry out those investigations. And I've talked about computers quite a lot um, here, but we also have mobile phones as well. Mm. Everybody has a phone in their pocket. Um, Organised crime groups, um, murderers, um, burglars, literally anybody, uh, they take their phone with them everywhere. That phone is recording um, where they are, locations, um, rough locations um, occasionally whereabouts they are but also it has um text messages whatsapp emails all the data on there pictures as well so yeah we have to look at the mobile phones as well on the digital forensics side mm -hmm. so it's basically it's a looking at a snapshot of somebody's life on a computer um, or a mobile phone to try and prove or disprove a crime um yeah. But yeah, hopefully, hopefully that gives a bit of a absolutely, and, absolutely, Simon. And and it might be just because me and the missus have absolutely spam watched Dexter at the moment. Um, in the <laughs> sense of like, um, it just sounds like obviously because he's obviously a blood spatter analyst. He he works in forensics, and it just sounds similar. So, did digital yeah. forensics did did, did the the caliber of work is it purposely mirroring a real life police setting? Is it was that the aim? Or is it just a case of like, look, a crime has been committed in real life, we'll use the forensics from a police department, and a crime has been committed uh, digitally, virtually, whichever way you want to put it, so we're going to put it into this setting. Is, are, they, are there purposefully similarities between the two? I wouldn't say purposefully, but there was no way of avoiding it because it is it, it is what it is. Um, forensics, so a lot of people transitioned over from what we call traditional or wet forensics 
in which is the blood spatter, um, fingerprints, footprints, and some other things. Um, they transitioned from that over to digital forensics um, to start um, from a low level, from the basic level of maybe examining some phones and progressing upwards because the digital side of forensics overtook significantly the actual traditional forensics in regards to police investigations. Um, I'm biased, of course, because I love digital, um, but you can prove a lot more um, in regards to data than you can um, with other aspects of forensics. Um, but obviously, it's perfect having the two together because they corroborate they corroborate each other. So there's lots that um, we can't do. On one investigation, it's good people this up. On one investigation, one of my favourite investigations from years and years ago, um, we were supporting a police force in regards to the examination of an iPhone, I believe it was. Um, you've got the um, member of the organised crime group um, taking photos from his iPhone. Um, one of them is holding a gun. Uh, he's been taking photos of the image quality of the iPhone was so good um, that we could zoom in and you can see the fingerprints on the I'm not even exaggerating you can see the fingerprints um, on the actual picture itself of it, of one of his fingers um, and they use that as um, some supporting evidence to show that it was him handling that um, firearm in, in, in that photo and that was years ago and imagine the quality of the pictures nowadays so uh, yeah the, and that's a perfect example of where the two, uh, the two combine but unfortunately with that as well, um, we'd often get mobile phones or devices in that were contaminated with fluids, so to speak, um, blood and some other ones as well. So you gotta be careful, um, especially when it comes to um, the prison phones, which are mm. tiny little phones that are a certain shape to make it easy to hide. Uh, yes. there. So uh, you gotta be careful with those ones and wear lots of pairs of gloves. Well, I was going to say that that the first part of that example was kind of like you were getting a bit of commission from Apple in terms of selling the uh, selling the iPhones and the camera. But uh, yeah, maybe it, it took a sour turn and did the laughing. <laughs> um, yeah, I just wanted to go back on a point that you were making uh, previously, just about how we've all got mobile phones uh, and obviously when a crime is basically like having a yeah, it is having a, a GPS tracker in, in in our pockets. Explain to me. Because I'm obviously being quite naive in the sense of when a crime is committed, and, and we all have this GPS tracker now, um, everyone, everything can be located to a pinpoint. Um, you know, I know we were speaking uh, before this, uh, I was both into mountaineering and, you know, the, the app, what what three words, uh, there's like a GPS tracker that can get you into a pinpoint on, on, on this earth. Why now can we just not solve uh, digital crimes like that if it's leaving um, like a GPS point where it's like, okay, it came from that uh, that VPN there or, or that IP address there. Uh, let's just go and, and remediate the action. Obviously, I'm being a bit naive. So why can't we just track that down as simple as that? Now, that's a good question. And a lot of misconceptions that people have are very similar to that. So your phone isn't actively constantly recording your GPS um, location. It's only when you're doing certain interactions with the phone that it will record a um, GPS position. Um, so I can remember probably 10 years ago, um, the phone was recording a lot of information and I believe Apple and Google both got into a lot of trouble with the amount of data it was recording. We were leveraging that data when examining the mobile phones to be able to show um, movement of people, um, but then, yeah, Apple and Google, um, I'm not sure which courts it was, but um, they got a sig significant amount of trouble uh, with that. So your phone isn't actively recording um, your GPS position constantly. If you take a photo, for instance, uh, the what we call the X information, the metadata of that photo, it will contain um, GPS coordinates uh, within that. But when it comes to you having your phone in your pocket and moving around um, there's another discipline within digital forensics which is called cell site analysis um, and what that shows is what cell tower what mast your mobile phone was connected to at the time so if a text message or a call comes in um, the mobile phone network operators so vodafone orange etc they will record what mast served that uh, that connection to your phone and with that you can show that they were in the coverage of the mast you can't pinpoint it um that's impossible um but you can show what coverage so if it's 
if the coverage goes out like that, um, mm -hmm. you can say that we're within that um, that coverage range of the mast uh, there. So you can um, put them in an area, but you can't actually pinpoint them uh, with that. But there are certain times that you can actually pinpoint uh, with um, geolocational data that is stored within the phone. It's just not a constant uh, constant record and, and involves um, certain actions to have to be taken um, by the user or the phone by itself uh, for that to be recorded somewhere um, within an application log. OK. Yeah. So to move it on then is DFIR, the, the latter part of this. So the instant response side of it. So is it a case? Let, let, let's let's carry on the um the analogy, the example of using the police, for example. Is it a case of um you've you've done the investigation piece now and now it's time to resolve the incident? Is that literally a case of what the IR team do? We're like, look, we've we 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 found the problem now and this is how we're going to remediate the action. Um again, is it as simple as that? Or is there a little bit more to it that the 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 latter element of this do? Perfect. So um no, um completely different. Um uh, for that, you could argue it, it is, um, and using the same terminology. However, in the real world, it, it isn't. So you've got the digital forensics, um, which is uh, the investigation of a crime, um, so to speak. The instant response side from DFIR, digital forensics and instant response, is a completely separate discipline. So um, years ago when I was supporting the police, I then moved over to the corporate side of life, and this is where a lot of the incident response um, side comes in. So a company um, or, uh, well, for instance, um, yesterday it was alleged that the MOD, it wasn't really the MOD, but the MOD were hacked. It was basically one of their suppliers for the payroll system that seems to have been hacked. So it's investigating um, hacks, basically. So you have the threat groups, the threat actors, um, who are the bad guys. Um, they will breach a, um, a network. Um, they might be doing it for a number of reasons to steal data, to encrypt data, to do ransomware. Um, it could be nation state, um, whereby it's a country supporting it and they're trying to um, um, find information pertaining to the, the government or um, they can, however, they can leverage that. But the instant response side is basically um, someone will call us up, be it an existing client who is on a retainer or a new client or a referral. It could be multitude of reasons, but they will get in touch and say, look, we believe we've been hacked. We will then go in um, and investigate that hack. Mm -hmm. uh, so the first first thing you need to do, you need to contain it initially. So if there is a, um, a threat actor on the network, we need to make sure that they have, no longer have access or deploy tools to that uh, network, such as um, EDR tools, which are like fancy antivirus tools, um, because the threat actors, the threat groups will be leveraging um, advanced forms of malware on that system to try and uh, reconnaissance it, to do lateral movements, try and move around the network and to exfiltrate to steal the data off. So we need to contain that, block off all access so um, they can do no further, further damage. Um, so once the containment piece is done, we'll then um, trying to detect what has happened, um, try and find what we call patient zero, which yeah. is the en entry point. So the initial computer that was compromised, um, do some analysis work around that to try and find out how they leveraged that computer, uh, where the poor security was um, that allowed um, for that. And then depending on the type of attack. So most of the work we get currently is ransomware. You see it on the news all the time. And so with the ransomware, it's devastating to the client um, because depending on which which threat group it is, um, they will go onto the systems. They may be on there for months, um, and what they're slowly doing often is exfiltrating. So slowly pulling off data. They're doing it so slowly that the network logs aren't showing a significant um, upload of data. So they'll do that slowly. They'll be uploading it to the dark web, um, and once they once they've done that and they've got enough data or they're worried they're going to get caught, um, they will then detonate um, some malware on that computer that will encrypt everything. It will encrypt all the computers on the network that are connected to that computer um, and therefore making all those systems um, inoperable, uh, therefore causing absolute devastation to the client. They will then post um, ransomware notes around the computer. They might email it if they've done open source intelligence work um, to try and find out the email addresses of the execs. And within that ransom note, it will say, look, um, you pay us £100,000 in Bitcoin um, 
Otherwise, you will not get your data back, which is encrypted in your systems. You pay us um, hundred thousand pounds. We will then give you the decryption uh, program that will decrypt all your data. But also, because we've stolen the data from your systems, if you do not pay us, we will then leak. We will release all that data onto mm. the dark web so that anybody can view it. Um, and often people pay the ransom because of the latter part, because having all that confidential information, um, personal identifiable information released, intellectual property released, is devastating for the um, company, uh, because companies can sometimes, um, if they've done everything correctly, restore everything from their backups. Um, so having the encryption is just a time consuming process um, to fix. Other times they don't have proper backup policies in place and um, they will need to have that or they need to accept the fact that that data is now lost and they just need to rebuild um, all their systems. So part of the instrument response piece is supporting on that um, that restoration and rebuild um, of it as well. So it's not just a case of just doing an investigation. We've got to support the client in getting back up and running as well. Mm. Once all that is done, um, we have to provide the lessons learned to the client, um, inform them what went wrong, why did this happen? Because we don't want them to have to go through this through this again because it's absolutely devastating. The amount of money that um, um, organisations lose because of this is absolutely um, devastating. I was at a talk the other week uh, where the NCSC, so the National Cyber Security Centre in the UK, um, they said that the biggest threat to UK companies at present is ransomware. Um, so let's put that, that into perspective. Um, having first-hand experience um, of supporting clients in that time of need, I can completely understand why, because um, I, I, don't, I, I don't know what the statistics are, um, but to me, probably because I work in the industry, it seems more common to see ransomware than it is to have a business go up um, in a physical fire, for instance, uh, which you could probably um, have inside information on um, with your family Why members. The fire brigade, but yeah, yeah. Pardon? Why do you think that is? Oh, um, so fire is either intentional or accidental, so um, something would have to happen to that for that to happen. But ransomware, you've got these hackers all over the world sit in a cozy cozy room or a um office if it's um built out that way literally is hacking all day long it's easy like and that's an, another reason why it, it's easier to be um a criminal on the internet um than it is in the real world because in the real world to burgle someone you've got to go out you've got to smash through the window you've got to actually steal stuff um whereas to be a hacker all you've got to have is a computer and some knowledge and you can just hack away all day long and yeah. there's probably more money involved in that um, with these yeah. with these ransoms or selling yeah. that information because we often see as well nowadays ransomware as a service so you have the big threat groups um who are based in other countries they will give a, a sort of commission to low-level hackers look if you can hack companies and give us the keys uh, to their kingdom um we will give you a commission um if they pay the ransom we'll give you a percentage of that as well so it, it, i wouldn't say it's easy money for them but it's um um easier than having a um, legitimate job i suppose but um obviously they've got no morals um or ethics um which is something i could not do so yeah i'd rather Absolutely. help people yeah. well uh, it links to a, a podcast that i did oh um yeah a couple of months back now um it was all about the uh the moral compass of an ethical hacker and how where on the spectrum you go oh, cool. um, yeah it was re just really interesting how like um chris had to like he, he he a lot of it is like retaliation stuff again we would we, we, i'm gonna draw links back with dexter just because i'm watching it as my tv series but a lot of it is like like i bet there is like there's instances where people had uh, maybe hacked in and stole um you know somebody's retirement fund somebody who might be ill um they stole the money so like when they come back it's like right i want to retaliate this person but then you're like oh okay this is this is the moral compass of 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 ethical hacking and it's like okay i'm in now i can do some serious damage but that's not what my job is to do and it's like which side of the fence are you on um so you made a point that um intrigued me in the sense of like just just the pure sophistication of the answer of, of, of the instant response piece to the digital forensics piece now it might have been just because um i'll have more time to answer on, on the instant response than digital forensics but do you do you, do you need to if you're an instant response consultant do you need to have a good fit footing in in digital forensics to succeed in ir because from my job in recruitment 
to come into IR, you can come at it from all different angles. You can come in as an out and out DFIR person that's that, that's maybe grown up in a sock and uh, they've decided, no, I want to want to carry this through rather than pass it. Or you can get people come from the police, as we've alluded to. Um, you can come from all over to get into incident response. My question to you in a roundabout way is, do you need to get the digital forensics foundations as as day one? You need to understand that in order to succeed, or is it all encompassing? Uh, good question. So basically, they're so intertwined, um, and it gets difficult trying to differentiate between the two. I've I may have oversimplified the differentiation, but the way I look at incident response is the um, fast action um, when actual incident, a cyber incident has happened, to sort that out. And digital forensics is the investigation of a offence or an alleged offence. Um, with that, but the disciplines and skills are very very similar um because we're looking at the same artifacts on the computers to try and we're looking at the logs to try and work um work stuff out in instant response as we do with digital forensics to try and get that timeline in place to understand what has happened um and it's just very similar. We're using very similar tools. Um, some tools using digital forensics that we won't use in IR. Some tools we use in IR that we won't use in digital forensics. But then there's tools that both uh, sides um, will use. But anyone on my team um, in the incident response teams, um, if we had a digital forensics case, um, for instance, inside a threat is what we call it, is where you have a rogue employee. Um, so they're trying to steal intellectual property. They're all um, a recruiter, for instance, they will try and um, steal the contact list of um, all their current clients and they will right. leverage that to get a decent job at a, a, a new place. Um, and then we might be called in to investigate that because um, having all that information um, could lose the existing company quite a lot of money. So investigating that um, would be a digital forensics, uh, digital forensics piece. So it's not all about uh, sport and law enforcement uh, with that, but literally it's the same mindset um, with digital. So sometimes i won't say all the time so sometimes digital forensics can be a little bit slower paced um okay. because the offense has happened um obviously it's different if something bad has happened and the person is on the run you're trying to find them or you're trying to um um, um get something sorted quickly but often with uh, digital forensics the offenses maybe happened months ago um whereas instant response is an active it's an active crime scene to be honest um that's a good way of putting it so an active crime scene that you're trying to um stop extending further um further out and causing even more damage so um yeah but the the mindsets are very very uh very similar uh with it yeah yeah um, pretty much my final question for you. I'm going to throw you one final uh, two-letter acronym because Scooter just loves acronyms. Um, do you think, what's your opinion on AI and how it has impacted DF and IR? Um, do, do you think it's helped out? Do you think it's made it harder? Um, what's your uh, holistic overview of AI and the acceleration that it's having on this industry? Ah, oh, brilliant. No, I, I wasn't expecting this question. I'm glad you asked, asked it because it's something that's quite close to my heart as with most people in cyber nowadays. But AI in DFII is a double-edged sword. So what I mean by that is it can make the analyst jobs easier in regards to doing the investigation. I'll give you some scenarios in a minute. Um, but also it makes our jobs harder because anybody can do the hacking now you can speak to chat gpt or it's dark web equivalent because there are what we call forks or so split offs from um some of these ai tools on the dark web that have all the restrictions taken off so if you type something into chat gpt um say write me a program to hack um into this type of server it may come back with i can't do that it's unethical um i don't want to do that you can kind of trick it sometimes into saying imagine the scenario of what would you do in this scenario to have this and there are ways around it but every time someone thinks of a way around it they obviously patch up which is which is great um but there are equivalents on the dark web that have those restrictions taken off so um what we used to call script kiddies which is whereby the hackers um we've not with not as much experience as experienced hackers, um, they'll just download pre-written scripts off the internet. Um, it's similar to that uh, vein whereby they'll just try and run loads of scripts at something. Um, if it works, brilliant, they're in. If it doesn't work, um, they'll just move on to the next low-hanging fruit um, target with, with, with that. 
but um yeah asking these ai tools um to write something specific for a server will make it easier for them to get in and we will see much more uptick in in successful attacks but then on the inverse of that the tools that are used um so in this in the security operation centers for instance the tools they're using to monitor um attacks they will be implementing ai um so it doesn't involve as much human interaction as before, so things can be picked up quicker than having to wait for a SOC analyst to be able to review something and um, uh, give a, uh, a safe or a not safe um, flag on it. But one of the key where areas, um, which goes back to digital forensics, where I think it will have the most impact from a mental well-being um, point of view, is a lot of the digital forensics work. Um, is what we call um, working on indecent images of children. So it's whereby I alluded to before, but it's whereby somebody will be downloading pictures of an uh, underage um, underage people um, doing things that they shouldn't uh, shouldn't be doing of a sexual nature um, or forced to, should I say? Having to go through a lot of that, and I've got a lot of colleagues in this industry, uh, in that area of work, having to go through that and categorise those into the different areas um, of severity, having a computer do that, and the analyst just doing validation checks of it will provide for, how can I word it, better better sense of mental health well-being, because it it's a hard job. Um, um, I completely respect the people that do that because they're obviously making a massive difference, but it's a job that you have, you have to take home with you because it's in your mind constantly and um, with that, but having a computer do a lot of that will take that impact away from them. So uh, that's a massive positive with that. But from an instant response um, point of view, um, we occasionally use AI um, when doing so. Obfuscation of data is whereby the threat actor will try and encode something in such a way that the antivirus tools don't pick it up um, and having to manually de-obfuscate that so put it into um, a way we can understand it or a computer can understand it uh, can often be time consuming but just telling AI to de-obfuscate um, this um, code uh, for instance on the locally running um, AI system it saves us so much time. We can just literally ask it questions. What does this command do in PowerShell? What does this command do in this programming language? And it will tell us. Um, so rather than having to spend a long time on Google trying to work something out, um, it gives us answers a lot quicker. But with AI, you got to be careful what you put into it. Um, never put client data in, never put anything along those lines um, in it, because at the end of the day, you just don't know where it's going or who's controlling um, that data. So um, you got to be super duper careful um, with that. Um, but yeah, there's no getting away from AI. It is the future. Um, I know we always have these buzzwords that are the future. Blockchain was the future at one point and um, other aspects as technology progresses. But AI, I cannot see any fork in the timeline going forward whereby it will not be uh, playing a massive part in all our lives uh, um, with, with that. Um, but yeah, we just got to embrace it um, and use it, use it safely, um, basically. Yep. But we know there are people who do not have that moral compass who will not use it safely. So uh, yeah, we've just got to be uh, careful with it. But yeah, That's it will have a huge impact. Yeah. That's it. And then once generative AI takes over, it's just time to down tools and just uh, let the let just say that computers won. Um, but yeah, so um, yeah, it's pretty much come to our time to be Simon. So thank you oh, very cool. much for the last half an hour. If anybody has any questions, anything raised today, um, as usual with all the other podcasts, I'll be sure to put Simon's info in the details for this video. But yes, once again, thank you very much for coming on the Scooter Space.